G'day to your viewers, and today on Ross and Jono, last week we discussed what led Moses Shapira to secure the 16 leather strips in a bank vault in Jerusalem yep. in the year 1878. Uh, and then uh, we talked about uh, what led him to retrieve those documents and go public with it in 1883, Ross. Um, right. This week we're going to be discussing the discovery, the incredible discovery that kept him busy for the better part of the years in between. That, That's of course, right. is the Siloam inscription. Now, you do touch on this. I think it's in chapter five of your book. And the book, of course, is our textbook, The Moses Scroll. By the way, um, we, we, everybody knows by now that this, of course, is available in paperback, hardcover and Kindle. Uh, you can get on Kindle right now, but it's also uh, recently been made available in audio fashion. That's right. They can get whatever form they want. Read it, listen to it. Yeah, how, however you want to do it. And get into it. Now, there's, you, you touch on, like I said, there's a few pages um, that touch on the uh, Salaam inscription. But since you wrote the book, Ross, um, an enormous amount of material around that period uh, has been main, made known to you. Yeah. Uh, and you've done an incredible amount of research. And we'd like to be able to uh, have a look at some of that and uh, share it with the viewers. Uh, so in this chapter of Shapira's life, mm -hmm. uh, characters... Uh, include people like uh, Conrad Schick, Herman yep. Guter, we're going to be talking about. Uh, before we get there, Ross, uh, I wonder if perhaps we might start, of all places, as briefly as possible, in October 1871 and the Great Fire of Chicago. People will be going, why are we going to be going there? Are we in Jerusalem? So you are we talking wait. about the Siloam inscription? So you want to you wanna take us back a little bit further, and I know what you're doing, mm. and I am excited to do this. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. I just and I th You got me all excited. I think to we have to do this. this. I think we have to do this, right? And I'm excited about this too, and there's a lot to cover uh, in the short amount of time that we have, but we're going to try and do this because uh, a couple of shows ago, we mentioned how we, we were talking about the Moabitica and how Dave and Patty brought us to the American con colony. And so uh, to have a look at some some pieces of Moabitica, which they did have on display there, uh, I, I want to talk about um, the, the Great Fire of Chicago. What does this have to do with the American colony? What does it have to do with the Siloam inscription? And then what does Shapira have to do with the Siloam inscription? So uh, we're eventually going to arrive in 1880 when all of this happens. So 1871, Ross, back in time. Wow. What do you think? Well. Horatio Spafford. Let's start with the mm -hmm. name Spafford. Uh, you mentioned 1871. He's a wealthy lawyer. Uh, he's a very, very well-known and reputable lawyer in Chicago, and he's got a couple of partners. But his real love, Jono, is, is religion. Mm. He loves religious studies. In fact, he's one of the supporters for Dwight uh, Moody. Everyone knows of Moody and the Moody Institute. Right. And, so he's yep. one of the financial backers of Moody. Uh, he and his wife are, are just good, solid Christian people. But Anna. a fire, a fire, a tragic fire hits Chicago, 1871. People know about this. It is just catastrophic. Thousands of uh, uh, businesses are destroyed. Among them is Spafford's law firm. And, and what this does, and this is just the quick version of the story, is that they have to reassess their life. You know, they spend a lot of time in the aftermath of the fire, particularly mm -hmm. Anna, uh, dealing with uh, the people who are homeless now. And, and mm. she waits on family's hand. Their home was not destroyed. And they lived in a nice area right outside the outskirts, but they took in people who were homeless to the point that that his wife was just just totally exhausted. Exhausted, the, exhausted. And it's understandable, Ross, because apparently 100,000 residents were left homeless. Uh, that's right. 300 people, 300 people were, uh, lost their lives apparently, which is relatively small considering that 100,000 residents were left homeless, oh, Ross. And so... Um, it's understandable that uh, she would have been exhausted. I imagine a lot of people were trying to accommodate and, and deal with the needs of, of so many, and uh, but yeah. she was certainly one of them. Go ahead. And, and, it, and physically and emotionally, to the point that ultimately Horatio took her to the doctor. The doctor, the family doctor said, you know, Horatio, your wife needs a vacation. 
You you mm-hmm. need to get her out of this. You've you've got things to such a place uh, that you've done all you can do, and so they made a plan, and the decision was that they would go to Europe. Now Horatio had been to Europe in a prior trip uh, alone, but this plan was he was going to bring his wife and four daughters uh, on an Atlantic a transatlantic. Uh, ride to Europe, and then there they would spend some time in the countryside. The fresh mm-hmm. air, the European culture would bring <clears throat> life back to his wife. And a well-deserved, well-deserved holiday, that's right, yeah. But but as, as this thing came about, as they got closer to the date, even some of the neighbors and people from their church said, you know, uh, can you bring so-and-so, like uh, a family members were going to go because the Spaffords were going to be on the, the vessel. On It's called mm-hmm. the Villa de Havre. In fact, the Villa de Havre was the second largest ship in the world at the time, and it was considered to be, really? excuse the, the way that I put this, but a ship of dreams, Jono, if you've heard this Truly. phrase. This was a, a beautiful high dollar. I mean, it was super top of the line. And Mm -hmm. and this voyage was to go from New York to Europe. Well, almost at the last minute, Horatio has a business deal. And, And remember, he's in trouble right now a little bit financially because of the destruction of his, his business. And, you know, Mm -hmm. he's trying to get things straight. So he has to back out at the very, very last minute. But you know, his wife didn't even want to go, but he said, listen, nothing, it's going to be wonderful. You go ahead. I'll catch the next vessel over. I just can't miss this opportunity. He and some friends mm-hmm. had made a land purchase, and the selling of this land purchase would put the family in a good place. So he convinces her to get on the boat. Well, as she gets ready to get on the, the vessel with the, the girls— uh, and I know you and I talked about this some time back as I started writing this up. Um, at, long story short, he gets this weird feeling and has her room moved to another room on the vessel. He pays to have this this take place. Mm. And the ship takes off. He waves goodbye. And in November of... Uh, this particular year, the Villa de Havre takes off, and in the middle of the night, another vessel strikes the Villa de Havre, and within 12 minutes, Jono, the vessel sinks. It's unbelievable, isn't it? They're in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, I think, if, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, and what are the chances of an enormous ocean? I mean, I understand that um, I, I ships know. have particular routes, but but for them to not, first of all, not see each other, but then to actually collide yeah. uh, is just horrific. And and as you say, 12 minutes and it's all over. Um, you also mentioned that uh, she had boarded with their, their four children, four daughters, right? Yeah, that's um, right. They are Annie, uh, named after her, Anna, um, age 12, Maggie, age 7, Bessie, aged 4, and 18-month-old Tanetta. Yeah. Um, what, what happens for us? So November 21st, 1873, uh, is the date that this takes place. About 2 o'clock in the morning on November the 22nd when this other ship struck. Now, remember, first of all, let me say it is a crystal clear night. I mean, the stars are out. It's cold, cold, though, November in the North Atlantic. It's not so very far from where the Titanic went down. But what what we have is we have accounts, quite a few, I believe, and you threw this at me at the last minute. I don't know all the facts like I had them in my head at one point. But as I recall, 226 people die, Mm. among those the four daughters. Now, she... The wife survives. Uh, a another ship, another vessel happens upon the the incident and is mm-hmm. able to, you know, the other ship that struck pulled the the rescued 
as many as they could find over the course of a mm. few hours into their vessel, but that boat was in trouble. And and so ultimately another boat comes, happens to it's the same route basically, mm. and mm. uh and transfers the survivors. But listen to this. She tells the story later uh about what a tragic event it was because they're all together on the deck. They're trying to get in one of the lifeboats, but it's just a catastrophe like you can't imagine. You know, one mm. of the lifeboats falls and crushes another lifeboat, and people are being flung oh. into water. And she falls into the water with the four girls. Mm. But the suction from the ship she later describes pulls three of them away from her immediately. Oh. And what? she she holds the baby as tight as she can, but at it just pulled too strong and pulled the baby. I mean, it, it is just the most horrible story you can imagine. She yeah. gets on uh. the boat. You can. She's just totally distraught, inconsolable. But mm. what we now have is the details around this ship sinking again. The Villa de Hav, eighteen seventy three. When she reaches Europe, she sends a telegram to her husband, Horatio, and basically all it says is, saved alone. Mm. Saved alone. And one of the reasons you mentioned we went to the American colony, we looked at those right. authentic documents on display there, the telegram mm. and so forth, and and uh, this is my American Colony coffee cup. Tragic story. Mm -hmm. And how do people get through something like that? It's in, it, unbelievable. But ultimately, he then, he finds out as soon as the news can reaches him, he gets mm -hmm. on the next vessel going across the Atlantic. You want to talk, touch on that a little bit? It's a devastating story. Even now, uh, even though I'm familiar with it, yeah. uh, you telling it again just really uh, is just a devastating thing to listen to. Yeah. Um, but he he does hear about it. He gets on the uh, on the next ship and he heads on over. And they end up, Ross. Why? Why do they end up in uh, Jerusalem? How does this happen? Well. So on the way over, uh, I'll touch this because I think it's so powerful, um, and it is so gripping. Oh, that's right. Yeah. As, they, as they're following the route, the captain mm. goes to Horatio Spafford, and he calls him to his quarters, and he says, um, Mr. Spafford, you should know that we are almost directly on top of the location where the ship went down and your children were lost at sea. Mm -hmm. And so he goes out onto the deck on mm -hmm. this vessel and pins the words to what is probably one of the most powerful uh, Christian hymns. It is mm -hmm. well with my soul. And if, mm -hmm. if anyone knows the words to this song, in fact, maybe we'll put a link in the description of this video, mm. when you think of Horatio Spafford, who has lost four daughters, mm. um, it's just, it really brings it home. Of course, it's Christian theology, but it's, it's his theology is mm. grappling with how do you continue when you've dedicated your life to God and you lose your four daughters. So it, it gets worse, though, and we, we have to say they do go to Europe, they ultimately go back home and they're still grappling with how do we continue, what do we do? And they decide they either give up on faith, which is mm. not an option, or they go all in, Jono. And so, all in so let me ask, for them meant go to, to go. the Holy Land. Yeah. And, and so, okay, so let me get this straight because uh, I'm a little bit confused about that. So, I mean, it, it is so very devastating, but it's, it's not just what happened with the ship. Of course, it, this is post dealing with the, the Chicago right. fire as we opened with. There's a tragedy that they survived because they were on the outskirts and they helped people and, and um, uh, beyond you know, what was called for uh, to the point of exhaustion where his wife needed a holiday. And so off they go, him believing that he's doing the right thing 
staying behind because he's believing that he's doing the right thing yeah. uh, uh, business-wise for the family, everything. He loses his his daughters and he pens uh, what is my father's favourite hymn, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Tis War With My Soul. Or, or Peace Like a River is the other uh, title for this hymn, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, And despite your theology, when you read that knowing the the backstory of how oh this was God. written is it's uh it's, it's a very solemn read in any case uh he goes over now what what i was not familiar with ross so remind me so you're telling me that he does meet her over in europe but they return home and if if yeah. I, now it's coming to me if i remember yeah. correctly yeah. they were were they shunned somewhat by the community yeah. because the community didn't know what to do with them and their tragedy. And yeah. theology dictated that perhaps it was uh, some sort of divine punishment yeah, maybe, upon them. Maybe what, what kind of sin do you have in your life that this could possibly happen? You know, and it was this very mm. rigid theology that that was brought to their attention, even subtly. Uh, not so much in their face, but they uh, Horatio and and his daughter uh, Bertha mm. uh, Spafford Vester writes about this. That ultimately their theology had to adapt in some ways, and and they felt like surely a God of love didn't mm. didn't cause this. It, it's so misfortunate, but ultimately what they came up with, a few stuck with them. And a few mm -hmm. very close friends, and they they started a group called the Overcomers. So you're mm -hmm. gonna you're gonna get through this, but it's gonna you've you suffered tragic loss. You're gonna get through this, and that's what they did. The Overcomers. So mm -hmm. they decide to move, not just uh, the Spaffords, but their close friends and other co-religionists decide to move to the Holy Land, and they're gonna spend the rest of their days helping other people and, and being active in the Holy Land, doing the Lord's work. You know, mm. where else could you do the Lord's work in total? And that's what they decided to do. So they do. And now what forms there is worthy of an entire story in and of itself. But I think... Which you are writing. Well, which, yeah, exactly. But it's just... It's, One of many projects not, that you're uh, working yeah. on. So, but they end up and they're they're in the Holy Land, and it's the tragedies aren't over yet. We have to touch on mm. one more, and that is that oh, they right. finally have a son who is Horatio Jr. And mm. at a very young age, like I don't have it in front of me right now. I can't mm. remember exactly. Maybe you do how old he was, uh, but Horatio Jr. also died. At the age of four, uh, of scarlet fever, That's in right. uh, February of eighteen eighty. Um, wow! So it it really is just. Uh, I mean, I'm surprised it's not a a, a movie. You it know? should be, and and maybe it, after we write the book, um, you know. And by the way, this this we're giving some of the good details about the book here, but I'm not going into all the detail because there's just too much. No, there's. It's, yeah. There's just there's a lot more to this that's incredible. But um, in amongst all of this tragedy and their determination and dedication to their faith, uh, uh, their endeavor to overcome, uh, they established the American colony. Uh, colony. Yeah. And, uh, and during that time, they adopt a child, Ross. Well, that's right. How did this happen? Yeah, so they they're part they in other words they get to know some of the Protestant community in and around Jerusalem or in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And uh those are some of the names that we'll talk about over the course of not only this episode but other shows. <clears throat> but one of the boys that they adopted was a teenager who uh was uh, he was orphaned, evidently. His name is Jacob Eliyahu. His family had come from Turkey, interestingly enough, from Turkey. That's gonna it's gonna all come together here in a little while. And and so Jacob Eliyahu was a student slash teacher at 
uh, Conrad Schick School. Uh, Conrad Schick is mm. the first scholar in Jerusalem, he's called. He's the man on the ground. He's uh, mm -hmm. He works between the Germans and the, uh, the English and everyone in Jerusalem or anyone in the world who knows anything about Jerusalem, they tend to work through Conrad Schick. So Conrad Schick has this young student teacher named Jacob Eliyahu who's working for him. And on July the 9th, 1883, Jacob Eliyahu is adopted by the Spaffords. And he brings great joy to the family after so much tragedy and, and lived with them in Jerusalem for the rest of his days. Uh, oh, so so let me ask yeah. you this, Ross. Um, yeah. I think I just heard you say that in 1883 he was formally adopted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so at the, at the time of his involvement uh, and, and it's um, imperative, his involvement in yeah. what we're about to talk about, the Siloam inscription, 1880, he is not yet adopted, but he's is he living with them at the time? Do you know? No, no, he's, he's not living with them yet. They're not even in the ah. Holy Land at the time. So they actually I see, I see. end up. Okay. They end up adopting a young mm. boy who uh, turns out made a great discovery, and that's where we're going to shift right now. We're going right. to talk about June of eighteen eighty. If you're ready. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. You ready? Okay. Go for so it. June of 1880, Jacob Eliyahu is a young uh, boy in Conrad Schick School. He loves archaeology, Jono. He's fascinated mm -hmm. with biblical stories, particularly of King David and the city of David and all that went on in ancient Jerusalem. And mm -hmm. there is a story among the locals uh, about a tunnel. Now, in 1838, see, we're jumping all over in the time, but I, I have to tell this, Robinson mm. and uh, mm. Warren and some of these guys are all over the Holy Land, uh, but 1838, the Siloam Tunnel, what we call the Siloam Tunnel, was actually discovered. And if you want to get the hair on the back of your neck standing up, you'll read the accounts of how they traversed that long tunnel the Siloam Tunnel. It wasn't as as nice and roomy as when you and I went through. This was this it's roomy. Was hard. It's roomy for you, Russ. Yeah. yeah. So but th this they just, they had at the time, by the way, explorers had to crawl on their belly and hold their mm. lips above the water. Um, right. At, at the time, yeah, I'm not I doing mean, that. it was bad. Um, yeah. I kind of feel like that when when I go through the Siloam uh, Tunnel because. Yeah. Because, because it's really it comes up to about you know my my chest. Uh, yeah. I have to sort of hunch over and, and get through. Whereas you can do cartwheels and you do all the I way do. through the slum yeah. and tunnel. laugh at you but, behind um, me banging your head on the, <laughs> the rock all the time. So before before Jacob Eliyahu uh, uh, has this this pivotal uh, part to play in the discovery um, uh, of the Siloam inscription, this tunnel. Uh, was was full of rubble, rubble uh, over yeah. the years. It, it it was just full of rubble with with uh, a muddy water trickling through silt, it. Silt, uh, silt all in the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And this is during the you know the the time when malaria was was problematic still. And uh, you know you can imagine the mosquitoes and everything that's going on there. But yeah. uh, Robinson discovers it. Uh, yeah, forty two years prior to the inscription being discovered right. and slowly but surely they're they're sort of opening it up and and getting through it and uh uh and well, they determine me, i think at that stage go ahead yeah i was just going to say that um very few people dared go in this the water would rise and fall within yeah, a going. tunnel that was almost uh you couldn't hardly get through it i mean explorers that are crazy like robinson did but the hmm. locals, uh, not only did they not go through it, they would go in either end. You, you've been there. I've been there. They would draw their water. Hmm. They might wash their clothes. They might do whatever. But they didn't dare go in the tunnel because the water rising and falling unexpectedly with the Gihon, the Gihon Spring, is, mm -hmm. is what is actually causing this. And, and they believed, now these are the, the superstitious locals, believed mm. that a demon 
or a genie or a dragon, all three of which mm-hmm. are reported in the sources, lived in that tunnel. So imagine right. you're a kid, 15, 16 you know, years old, and, and yeah, you're brave. Is, yeah. And so what we have is we have a case where a boy, Jacob Eliyahu, and his friend Samson decide they're going to brave the tunnel. And, and they're going to start... Sam, they're going to start on different sides. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Samson is going to start in the north. Jacob Eliyahu is going to start in the south. And the plan is they've got a little candle with them, uh, you know, and and they've got ropes and they've got their. They think they're ready for this adventure. Evidently, they skip school this day. They take off, and as they're walking, Jacob is coming from the southern end. He stumbles. And we know this mm-hmm. because the story that ultimately followed is reported throughout the world, and, and it's it's in the sources. And so what happens, he's about 15 to 20 feet from the southern entrance, and he stumbles mm-hmm. on the uneven flooring there. And as he gets closer to the wall, right, he gets mm-hmm. closer to the wall on the eastern wall, he notices what appear to be writing. They can't Mm. read it, but it's some kind of script on the wall. So he he quickly gets his bearing. He realizes what's happened. By the way, he finds out that uh, Samson got spooked. He must have run into the genie or something. So he takes off. Let let me tell you what happened, Russ. Uh, (laughs) What what actually happened? I have I have the inside information on this. Uh, It turns out that um, Sam Samson was six foot five. Yeah. And as he entered the uh, the tunnel, uh, it didn't take long for him to realize that uh, he's going to have to be hunched over trying to work his way through this tunnel, and he just <laughs> wasn't up for it. And, and he said so. to himself, "I am not. I'm not doing this." And so he 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 went he went back. Whereas right. uh, Jacob Eliyahu was only three foot five, like he, like he was. He was the perfect size human. He just walked through. <laughs> perfect size human. Yeah. And okay. So get this. I'm sticking to that story. Go ahead. All right. I believe you might be right. We don't know that. We just think he got <laughs> spooked. But either way, Tell so Jacob it. Eliyahu now has to go to his teacher, and mm. and he does. He goes to Conrad Schick. Tells Conrad, Conrad Schick. Schick, teacher, I found some writing, uh, 15 feet from the southern entrance, and so forth. So Schick goes with him, brings all the necessary things, including his notebook, and he recognizes the importance of young Jacob's discovery because on the Mm. wall, now remember the water, not only does it rise and fall periodically, but the water is covering the bottom of of what Schick determines to be an ancient inscription. Now, in, in his first report on this, he writes a letter to the Germans and ultimately informs the British as well uh, I've got both of those reports, and and he 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 describes about a two foot by two foot inscribed section on the wall on the eastern mm. wall of the tunnel, fifteen feet from the southern entrance, and it, he can't tell how many rows of script there are because it's partially submerged. Now, in his report, he says that it looks like a tablet has been written in situ, meaning it was made in the tunnel and not made outside and nailed to the wall. A place Mm. was kind of worked out, smoothed out in the rough wall of the tunnel, smoothed, prepared for writing, and then someone inscribed. He says, Mm -hmm. I think he reported eight to ten lines. Turns out it's only six, but he couldn't tell. So, Or is it? Or he, is it, Russ? We'll discuss that a little we're bit later. We're going to discuss that too. So mm-hmm. he he makes a quick assessment of what's it going to take. So he, by the way, he looks on the western wall, and on the western wall is a niche carved out in the rock where the ancient inscribers probably, and I think this is the case because I've I've charted the soot there around that area. It looks like they mm-hmm. had an oil lamp while the guy was, or I, I assume a guy. There I am. Chiseling the, the, the yeah. inscription. But it, yeah, mm-hmm. so he, he writes it there. Now, he he looks around and he says, okay, to get this, the he notices that the letters are written in what he calls Phoenician script. 
It mm. is June of 1880. So he refers to it as Phoenician, and he says that the letters are small. Uh, each letter form is small, and they're not engraved deeply. So you have to make a cast. Now, you've, you've, we've told our viewers what a cast is, but just to refresh them, you, you take like paper mache and you mash it into an inscribed surface, let it dry, pull the inscription, the paper out, the dried paper, you have a reverse mm -hmm. image of what's on the wall. Yep. But he he notes that that's not going to work here, Jonah, because first you have to lower the water in the tunnel and keep it out. So in order to do that, you have to remove the rubble. And in order mm -hmm. to do that, you know, and he builds this work plan in, on the spot. And ultimately, he says, you know, we may have to clean this wall with a chemical compound of some sort to get the silicate out of the engraved letters. He mm. can only make out a few letters. He, he's not real sure. He certainly doesn't know what it means. Uh, but he so he gets he gets everything in his notebook and then he goes out. He sends a letter to the German, later writes uh, to the British. And what we know from following the accounts, I downloaded and read in many cases, translated the German, the French, all of these documents are flowing about the uh, Siloam inscription. But just know this, June of 1880 is the discovery. Yep. He writes the Germans, June the 22nd, he writes a letter. The Germans receive it. They publish that letter in a German uh, journal for uh, research on July mm -hmm. the 7th. But it takes... He doesn't get anything really going until around November of uh, of that year of 1880 because he's sick. Uh, he's really, really he's older by this point, but he's also sick. Mm. And one of the things that he has to do is uh, he wanted to get permission from the municipality because if the Ottoman authorities know that there's some kind of archaeological project going on and they've not been, uh, they've not approved it, the whole mm -hmm. thing's off and you're going to get in trouble in autumn in Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. he he writes in one of his accounts, Schick I'm talking about, writes that yep. he, he, he needed someone, the guy who was over the municipality was not friendly to Europeans, as he put it. But that guy mysteriously died, Jono, and a new guy is put so over it who happens to be a friend and associate um, of uh, Conrad Schick. So ultimately, everything works out for the good, and Conrad mm -hmm. Schick begins to work. And this is about the time, very early on, that things begin to get interesting, and I can go through those pretty quickly, but... Did you have any questions before I say I want to get into the Shapira stuff? But but let me know what yeah, you think. Yeah, no, there, I know that you've got uh, a lot on the topic of Shik because, of course, as we mentioned last week, um, it was a year before, uh, and I'm talking presently, that you presented um, a, a paper at a conference enti uh, entitled uh, "Conrad Shik and His World." Um, yeah. So I'll let, I'll let you run through that bit, but I am interested in um, uh, Shapira's involvement. And I do want to just sort of quote something from page 30 on your book when okay. we get to that. So let, let me know. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So basically, let's let's talk about that because what, what happens is when I wrote the Moses Scroll, I knew of a couple mm. of things, and, and I will, we'll get to the condor in just a minute. But what, what I do mm -hmm. know is that right away – uh, Shapira is involved, and the reason I even got interested in this is because of Miriam Harry's book. In Miriam oh. Harry's book, The Little Daughter of Jerusalem, now she's writing as a young girl, and she's looking back, and she's recalling events in her life with her dad. And right. one of the things that she says 
Do you want to read that quote? Do you have it open? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's exactly where I was about to go. So um, let me just read this. This is page 30 of, uh, of the book in Chapter 5. The newfound inscription told the story of the construction of the ancient waterway. Upon hearing of the discovery, Shapira hurriedly made his way to Siloam, uh, quote, a village notorious for the fanaticism of its inhabitants, end quote. And that is from <clears throat> Little Daughter of Jerusalem by Miriam Harry, his daughter, yeah, uh, yeah. to obtain Shapira, to obtain a copy of the newly found inscription. Uh, Shapira began work immediately to translate and interpret the meaning of the Siloam inscription. Uh, and at that time, and we'll talk about this in a moment, he makes uh, the acquaintance of a young German scholar by the name of Hermann Goethe, so important uh, to this uh, story, who was there excavating in Jerusalem, uh, and so on and so forth. Right. So listen, yeah. um, one thing, that, and I want you to elaborate mm -hmm. on this because uh, I know you've got more information on it, but oh, when yeah. I read this, the first thing that came to my mind, and going back to um, the question of how many lines of scripts are there uh, in the Salaam inscription, was the report that we've touched on so many times uh, but can go no further with, and that is, of course, the claims of Professor Galil uh, saying that he has discovered within uh, the, the, the Hezekiah's Tunnel and various uh, locations around about further inscriptions, um, yep. not just further inscriptions but lengthy inscriptions, and in addition to that, additional lines, I think he said to you, oh, additional yeah. lines in the Siloam inscription itself. Um, the thing that, that struck me about this, Ross, is that here we read that um, Shapira hurriedly made his way to uh, uh, to get the information and began work immediately yeah. to translate and interpret the meaning, uh, the, the meaning uh, and make it available uh, to the scholars and to the public and so on and so forth. We're still waiting years. What has it been, three, four years? I don't know how long it's been. It seems like it <laughs> just goes on forever uh, for, for Professor Galil to tell us what he's found and to show us where it is and to see the photographs and offer it to uh, scholarly criticism and and well, um, you never know. Look, I tell you, the thing is, I was in good communication with him on Facebook Messenger, and then I lost my Facebook account. He might have sent me all the answers. So who don't who knows? But look, <laughs> not only does that quote exist in Miriam Harry, but there's there's also a, as that story on the next page, there was an Arab riot at the time. And the family is worried because Shapira is off doing his biblical researches. And she says that he comes back. This is the, listen, this is the reading. Uh, he comes mm. back. Uh, let's see. He was hugging a half-finished tracing and was far more perturbed at having been interrupted in his work by the thought of the terrible risk he had incurred. So, they're like, honey, where have you been? There's an Arab riot. And he said, do you realize that I'm in the Tunnel of Siloam tracing a, an ancient inscription? I'm not worried about these people. So, because he, you know, he's in a bad part of town too, but he doesn't care. So since, since the publication of the Moses Scroll, <clears throat> I've now proven with Matthew Hamilton's help. Again, Matthew Hamilton is our go-to guy. He knows everything, mm -hmm. Shapira. Brilliant, brilliant researcher, Australian guy like yourself. <clears throat> but he he sent me notice. I had a suspicion that Shapira was one of the first in the tunnel to work on this for other reasons. But he mm -hmm. sent me a uh, a link to a Russian... Um, oh, a yeah, Russian right. church leader at the time had a diary and in 1881 had entered an entry about Shapira's work on the Siloam inscription. So I knew he was there. I knew he was there for a couple of other reasons, and, and this is where we're going next. Can I interrupt so, you just one second? Is, yep. Just out of curiosity, is that the same Russian church leader that uh, also happened to mention the and we're yet to confirm this specifically, but but yes. mentioned that the uh, sixteen leather strips were found in a, yep. a a clay vessel. Okay, brilliant. Okay, please yep. continue. So Antonin is the guy's name. So anyway, mm. so um, it, meanwhile, work begins around November of eighteen eighty. Discovery was mm. uh, June of eighteen eighty. So a few months later, 
they begin working to get the rubble out of the way, and and uh, Schick is making his own attempts to make squeezes and or tracings and or drawings, and Shapira is also candle mm-hmm. in hand or lamp in hand, and they're trying to work on. Meanwhile, again, work is going on through the municipality uh, with the blessing. Schick hires locals. They uh, He pays for tools. He gets some money from the English and from the Germans. Everybody's interested mm-hmm. in this. Mm, in doubt. February of 1881, a guy by the name of Archibald Sacy shows up. Oh, Sacy, English yeah. chap. Right. And yeah. he... Um, begins to work on it. Two times in February, this time of year, uh, 1881, he makes observations on what he thinks it says. In fact, he produces the earliest published transcription uh, and proposes that it's it's Phoenician, that it is uh, probably a record of Tyrian, you know, from Tyre, the builders mm-hmm. from Tyre who David had hired. So he puts it generally in the time of David, uh, and he, he makes his first guess and sends this all over the world. No one is talking to Schick and uh, Shapira about what Sacy is saying at this point. So sacy has got all the attention of the wor- readers in the world. They're reading his account. Mm. Uh, but people begin to wonder how he can get what he's getting from these sorry copies that they're looking at. You know what I'm saying? Mm. They're they're looking Mm. at the Bassant in England and uh, Neubauer and all these guys are saying, this is hopeless. We're never going to get a good inscription. But Goethe is in Germany, and the German-Palestine Association uh, decides to send him to go to Jerusalem to work closely with um, with Conrad Schick, one of his main missions. Now, he's got other work under the guise of doing other archaeological work in the city of David, which he does. The main thing they're interested in is this uh, inscription that's clearly ancient, clearly Israelite, or, you know, it dates to the, uh, it's in Israel, it dates to the biblical mm. period. Now, it's so during Guta, this time, Ross, yeah. that, um, that Guta establishes a, a, what, a working relationship or, or, or a working friendship with Shapiro? Is, is, is this the first going. time they've met? That's, that's where okay. we're going, yeah. So Go Guta ahead. arrives in March of 1881. Uh, I've translated his German works, you know, using mm. online tools and so forth. Uh, oh, which is he, on uh, Kindle now? Is that right? It's available on Kindle as well. Well, the the uh, fragments of a leather manuscript is yes. But, but I'm talking about his uh, Guta actually oh, published some the, works on the Siloam inscription. The Siloam inscription. The Siloam in Schrift is one of his mm. his works, uh, and they were published right away, almost. Mm. But the bottom line is. They get into the tunnel, and when Guta arrives, he compliments Schick on everything that he has done to that point, but he has a piece that no one else has tried yet. Schick had recommended that the wall, the surface of the inscription, be cleaned to get the silicate out to make a good um, a, a good squeeze and squeeze. ultimately a cast. Mm. This is where Guta's real work comes in. By the time he gets there, Schick has already handled the removal of the water. And uh, so he's made good, good progress. Sacy's getting more and more out of his work, trying to figure out what it says. He's making corrections in his own work. Guta gets uh, more of the water out. And now he starts chemically cleaning. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, again, this was Schick's idea. Ultimately, what happens is, is that before he leaves Germany, he asks around, because Guta's a young guy. He asks the older huh. scholars, is there anything, what do you do to really clean a, an inscription? And just so happens that a newly published work uh, by a scholar by the name of Hubner, uh, a German scholar, 
had just published, and I'm paraphrasing, but the English translation is roughly how to make a good mechanical uh, inscription clean, you know, for taking of, I mean, it was a perfectly titled work. So he takes this with him Specific and everybody just tells him, Guta, be careful. Don't damage this inscription. Mm. So he treats it with acid uh, on three different occasions, but he's working with a Jerusalem-based team, namely Shik and Shapira. These two guys are friends. Now, by the way, by the time the inscription is discovered in 1880, Shik and Shapira have been friends for 25 years, Jono. In fact, Shapira was a member of Shik's school and learned trades working for Shik oh, uh, when right. he first yeah. came to Jerusalem. Mm. Yep. All right. You ready? I thought you were mm, about to ahead. hit me with a question. All right. So, no, no. <laughs> right. so ultimately, uh, Guta is, is steady working on making it better and better with these acid treatments. Now, in May... In May of 1881, May 28th, Condor, Claude Condor, the famous uh, soldier scholar for the PEF, mm -hmm. arrives in Jerusalem. He's been away for six years. When he's there, the, one of the first things he does, you can imagine, he goes to the Siloam Tunnel, and guess who he sees? He sees Shapira, and he sees uh, Guta, and they have a conversation which is later published. And I quote this in the book, and I think it's important uh, to read it there. Uh, let's see if I can find where it is. Now, okay. they know each other. And last time last time Condor was there uh, was during the Moabitica affair, right? And That's he, right. Uh, as we mentioned um, during that uh, program, uh, he's quite the artist, and he drew a lot of these pieces uh, to, you know, show them uh, in uh, in England. Yeah, and um, uh, so it's been six years. It's been six years since he's been That's back. Right. It's amazing. That's uh, right. And lo and behold, uh, uh, there are the boys. Go ahead. Yeah, and so remember, the world is waiting for a good uh, copy of this. Besant and Neubauer and the Germans. Uh, everyone has thrown their hands up and said, this is helpless. We're never going to get a good transcription. How can we know what it says without a good picture of this thing? They didn't have hmm. iPhones in. Imagine now we could just, right. you know. So in July of 1881, excuse me, uh, the PEF Quarterly published, this is on page 31, Jono, in the mm -hmm. Moses Scroll. Yeah. He says, Condor writes this, Mr. Shapira gives a different interpretation to the text, explaining it as referring to the cutting of the tunnel from two opposite ends. This, we know, was really how the excavation was affected, and Mr. Shapira's intimate acquaintance with the Hebrew idiom as a Talmudist of 20 years' education seems to render his opinion worthy of consideration. Mm -hmm. Now, this is fascinating because I went back and proved that up until May of 20, May 28th of 1881, when this was penned, we have the date on his actual letter, mm -hmm. no one had ventured to interpret what it meant that two teams of workers worked towards the middle. Here's Condor. He tells us that Shapira's the first guy. He's mm. the one who figured that out. Now, if you go, when you and I went to the tunnel, everybody in the world knows that the inscription so talks about two teams working together. But they didn't mm. know it then. Shapira was the guy. Is there, let, let, yeah. me, let me ask you, and this is the city of David, uh, Hezekiah's tunnel. Where is the, uh, the plaque that tells us the story of Shapira's interpretation and how that happened? It's not there yet. It's not there yet. 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 It's not, but it should I'm be, telling you, Jono, this is one of my dreams is to get this plaque. And now that I'm close with Ronnie Reich, I hope to have it. But what we're going to mm -hmm. do is we're going to tell the real story 
uh, and we're going to get, and the first step was done this time last year, February of 2023, in mm-hmm. uh, Jerusalem at the Albright Institute. But that's another story. Right. So here, here's the deal. Shapira. So, yeah. So I, I'm sorry to interrupt. So, so the, the question that I have, though, is um, Stacey has a, he's, he's first. He's first in with a uh, uh, yep. publishing uh, a, an interpretation of, of, of what it says. And uh, Shapira has one which we know is more correct, uh, attested to by Condor. How do these two uh, translations or interpretations differ? It's mainly that Shapira is the first to get enough of the clues together and read enough of it to know what it says, whereas Sacy is uh, premature in his publication. In fact, that's what Condor ultimately says. He says, those in Jerusalem think that Sacy is premature in his reading and, and his interpretations. So, and I cover some of that in the book, but more of it in the article that I've published on academia. That too will be in, the link will be in the notes, uh, in the description. Remind me, remind me though, was there not a discussion, was there not some controversy about um, Shapira's uh, usage of, I think, was it 200 and 1,000? That's where we're going. Can you remind me of that? Yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah. So ultimately... Hmm. what what Shapira does is he enters the fray. He publishes because everyone they're going they're going back and forth on the, the here's what I think it says here's what I think mm-hmm. it says and and what happens is uh, Shapira finally publishes in the Athenium what he believes that it says. And, mm-hmm. and so one of the things that he brings up, which turns out to be a big, big fight in the academic world, is mm-hmm. that Shapira reads, everyone had been saying that line five discussed uh, a, a distance of a thousand cubits, right? A thousand cubits. Mm-hmm. Whereas when Shapira looked at it, he said from the beginning, very early, he says that the inscription didn't say a thousand, but uh, twelve hundred. Okay, so ultimately, uh, Shapira's was proven correct, and it, but it was only proven correct twelve hundred cubits instead of a thousand cubits. Long afterwards, I mean, people were fighting was about at this the time, in right? the documents. What's that? He was laughed at at the time, if I remember. Listen to this. I'm Correct. going to read you from July of 1881. This is hmm. Shapira. He's writing in the Athenium. The interest your paper and English readers took in the discovery of the inscription found in the lower pool of Siloam will excuse my writing to you. Neither the attempt of Mr. Schick, nor that of Professor Sacy, nor that of Dr. Guta, who has been sent from Leipzig by the committee of the Deutsche Palestina Verein to copy the inscription, has been successful. Shapira says, I myself tried three times and found I was only making every time another blunder so that we must admire, I love this, the talents of the learned scholars of Europe, and especially that of Professor Sace, who have been able already to tell much, so much from bad copies. So then he goes in to say, uh, line five is 1,200, not 1,000. And then he gives the Hebrew that he sees on the wall. The Mm. people back and forth begin to argue against that. Here's what Neubauer says the next week, same newspaper. It would therefore be premature to discuss Shapira's readings uh, given in his letter to the Athenium. Mr. Shapira was probably misled. He said 200 and 1,000 in line 5. Hmm. That's not even biblical. We know, he says, we know that biblical Hebrew, Jono, you silly little boy, you shop owner, (laughs) you souvenir shop running uh, Palestinian Jewish shop, this high scholar says, Hmm. we know that the hundreds can't come before the thousands. In mm. biblical Hebrew, he says the thousands come first. Well, he's mm. wrong, Jonah. 
because immediately the next week, Guta, who has become friends by this point uh, with, uh, Guta has become friends with Shapira because they're working mm. together on it. Yeah. He says, what about Numbers chapter 3, verse 50, where the hundreds come before the thousands? So he goes, don't, don't give me that. Shapira's right. So this mm. argument, but wait, he goes on. Uh, the next month, Couch, K-A-U-T-Z-S-C-H, the scholar in German, says, uh, in order to do all justice, we also register in the transcription that Shapira has commuted to us, new correct readings can be found. And then he goes mm. on to say uh, that Shapira has sent them good copies for the first time. Now, this is all, no one has written on this. In fact, my friend, the scholar Ronnie Reich, uh, uh -huh. in his book, uh, wrote all about the description of, Sh of the discovery of Siloam. He mentioned Shapira. We're going to get to this at the close of tonight, uh, but in a very negative light. So let me read a couple more points. Neubauer, uh, criticizing Shapira's 1,200 cubits, <clears throat> said, if Colonel... Warren's measurement of the tunnel at 1,708 feet in length is right. Mr. Shapira's 1,200 cubits would show that its constructors could not measure correctly. So it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek. You're, you're just, you know, you can't do it right. You're, you're wrong. Wow. One more point. Mm. In August of 1881, this is all rolling. It's like every week when the newspaper comes out, people are either uh, fighting against Shapira's points or making fun of him. This is Sacy. I have hitherto refrained. Put your nose in the air when you read this. I have hitherto refrained from replying to Mr. Shapira's letter on the Siloam inscription as I thought it useless to enter into controversy about hypothetical readings. Now, however, the lime with which the letters were filled has been removed by means of hydrochloric acid. Lieutenants Condor and Montel have thus been enabled to take a squeeze uh, of the inscription, a tracing of which is at present lying before me. And then he goes, um, there is a point after, and then he gives the Hebrew letters, Beit, Mim, Aleph, Tav, Yud. As in my copy, this is the big part, so that Mr. Shapira's ungrammatical 200 and a thousand falls to the ground. It will be important. <laughs> I hope Mr. Shapira will remember, Jono, in the future, that skill in reading Talmudic literature does not necessarily imply epigraphical skill as well. Wow. Drop the mic. He thinks he's right. <laughs> <laughs> and he's wrong. And so he's wrong. Ultimate, my word. He, ultimately, wow. ultimately, mm. after by the time now this is in eighty one. By eighteen eighty two, eighty three for sure. Mm. Everybody knows that it says twelve hundred, and not a thousand. But Mr. Sacy, nose in the air, pompous scholar that he is, yep. never credited Shapira. But he mm. here's what here's what ultimately he said: I stand corrected. Guta is right. Now, how <laughs> no one has ever brought Guta's reading of twelve hundred in, but Guta mm. publishes twelve hundred after. Condor has already told us, and others have already told us, and Shapira's already published his reading of 1200. Mm. So the point mm. is, Shapira's one of the first people in the tunnel working on deciphering the inscription. Uh, yep. Shapira is the first on record to understand that the, the inscription said it described builders working in two teams from the outside in. Now, mm -hmm. by the way, in 1838, Robinson had already uh, pr uh, proposed that that's the way the tunnel was built, but they didn't have an inscription that said that. Right. 
Mm-hmm. And Shapira was like, oh, look at this. This is a record right. of the actual building, and it's saying this. So what I want people to understand is that far from just a little shop owner with some Talmudic experience, Shapira beat the best scholars of his day, identified what this paleo said. He is a genius, and he was never mm. given the credit, the credit. Uh, that he deserved. And you're right. We mm. need to have a new plaque. A new plaque that yeah. says this story right outside the city of David. Mm, yeah, quite right. So uh, here's a question, Ross. Yeah. Um, you've you've been, as I said, cartwheeling through the uh, Hezekiah's Tunnel a number of times, and you've seen the inscription. Let me ask you, is this the original inscription that you're viewing there? Do you see any other writing about it? What can you tell us about what you see on the wall? Great question. What's on the wall when you walk through? The first time I walked through, it it actually even says this is a replica of the original inscription. And it's it's on it's on a plaque. It stands out from the wall, little light shining on it. And and mm-hmm. what people think they're looking at, they're looking at a replica. Uh and the authentic, we'll talk about what happened to that in just a moment. Uh, but this is a few feet to the north of where the Uh original inscription was. And so um, after I did the research and obviously did the lecture at uh, the Albright Institute, I went back in the tunnel to go really spend some time and and think through the whole story again. And sure enough, it's obvious. You come upon the place where the inscription was in the wall. Now, let me tell you, one of the options that Guta entertained when he was sent by the German Palestine Association uh, to Jerusalem to work on this, he considered mm-hmm. should we remove it from the wall, but he said no because it, it's very, very likely, almost without doubt, it's going to be shattered if we try to remove it. Mm-hmm. So uh, he doesn't. He cleans it in place and they take the inscription. But what we know, Jono, is that in 1890, uh, it comes up missing. Like, it's it's chiseled out of the wall. It's reported um, to, among other people, Conrad Schick hears about it. Sure enough, they go in there. It's been smuggled out. The English, everyone's looking for it. And I have discovered in my research now, not only... Um, I know who chiseled it out. I don't think I'm going to give that tonight, though. I don't. I don't think so. But I can uh, you mention that. All right. All right. Let's let's uh, save that. We'll, we'll save that. We'll come nugget. back to it. We've given them enough nuggets already. But I mm. know mm. who got it. Who chiseled it out? So it's taken to a very wealthy person in Jerusalem, and uh, once it is tracked down and it's found, one of the Englishmen associated with the PEF finds it in the home of this wealthy Jerusalem person. Uh, It's put on display for a short period of time in Jerusalem, and then it's crated up and shipped to Constantinople, now Istanbul in Turkey. Mm. And you go, well, why Mm. was it shipped there? Because the Ottomans Mm. actually ruled Jerusalem. So that's, I mean, that's nowhere else it would be sent. They claimed it. This was discovered in Ottoman Palestine, it's ours, and so and it's, it's still, it's still there. there today. Yeah, it's still there today, and will it ever be returned? I kind of doubt it, but you never know. You never know, Ross. Well, but, a couple um, of times, a couple of times, we felt like we were getting close. Uh, just the last rumors. couple of years, mm. there were rumors that mm-hmm. uh, Erdogan had sort of, kind of, halfway committed to sending this back to Jerusalem, uh, but mm. Erdogan uh, doesn't seem to be a good ball player. I mean, he's not a team player. Uh, that uh. that turned out to either be false or he reneged or whatever. But All right. but whether or not it comes back, the story needs to be told of one of the greatest, to this day, one of the greatest archaeological discoveries. There is so many connections. There are so many connections to Moses Wilhelm Shapira, including him being the unsung hero mm. of what I call. Very much so. Shapira and the Stone of Siloam. That sounds mm. a lot better than, you know, I, I want it, I want it to sound sort of like a 
really cool. Can you imagine on the big screen, ladies and gentlemen, the stone. take your seats and get ready for this, this show, Shapira and the Stone of Siloam. Man, I get chills. That's going to be yeah, good. No, like that. that is kind of cool. Good. All right, so listen, I think we've done a pretty good job of this. You've, you've really unpacked this in detail. There's a lot more information that you just gave us now that didn't make it to the book. You're working on other projects, which will eventually uh, become books in their own right, um, with even more information on these topics. Uh, looking forward to that. But uh, I did mention, of course, that um, uh, the Shapira's, uh, the Moses Scroll, uh, this is our textbook. We're working our yep. way through it. We just touched on a few pages in Chapter 5. Uh, this is, of course, now available in audio book. And the other one that you just held up, uh, Herman Guter's um, uh, work on the same scroll, yeah. um, which is now available in Kindle. You can get that straight away if you don't have that already. I don't think it's available in, in an audio just no. yet. But, um but that let is me, the update. Are there any other any other updates or anything else? Yeah, let me let me let me add one up? more detail. Let let me set us up for next week's show if I can. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Because you you mentioned this book, Herman Guta, fragments of the leather manuscript containing mm -hmm. Moses's last words to the children of Israel. In this document, by the way, once the Tylers and I uh, worked together to get this thing in English, it starts off like this, Jono. Mm -hmm. On the 30th of June of this year, now it's 1883, by the way, mm. I was visited by the famed antiquarian and bookseller uh, M. Shapira from Jerusalem, agent of the British Museum, German subject since 1882. During my stay in Jerusalem in the spring and summer of 1881, I had made his personal acquaintance interest in the then not yet securely read Siloam inscription led him many times to me, and I visited him repeatedly at his shop on Christian Street. So mm -hmm. they're back and there. forth. They're working together on the inscription. Um, and and I, I want to add, because it, it pleases me greatly, that when we went to Jerusalem <laughs> for the Conrad Schick conference, and I gave this talk on the Salom inscription, which, by the way, that talk is on my YouTube channel, just like it was given. Mm. Uh, Seth uh, improved the video a good bit, by the way. But anyway, Ronnie Reich, who is the man, right. the scholar yeah. for the city of David, was over uh, the archaeology portion, which my talk fit under. And he asked me on the spot, he said, can I use your research in my forthcoming book on uh, the Siloam and, and so mm. forth? It's going to be in, in Hebrew only. And I said, yes, of course. So he's going to publish this. Uh, it, it hasn't come out yet. But subsequent to that, Seth actually took a, an old photograph that we found, uh, I found doing my research, and, and made that into probably the best graphic of the Siloam inscription. And I think that Ronnie's going to use that in his book as well. So this oh, Siloam inscription is, <clears throat> is a very, very big deal. It's a very important part. Mm. And, and uh, I think it goes a long way towards redeeming the reputation of Shapira. And, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. So... Most certainly. Oh, we'll, we'll be uh, very keen to find out when that oh, book is published. I'd love to get I, a copy I, I of that. I distracted myself. One sec, one more thing. So Shapira and, and Guta get to know each other in Jerusalem in 1881, spring and summer. So this is why Shapira, we're going to open next week's uh, discussion with Shapira going to Germany and the person he ends up working with, with this newly discovered manuscript, newly brought out of the, the uh, bank vault, is Herman mm -hmm. Guta. So that's Herman where it's going to tie everything back together. And Edward Meyer, absolutely. We'll be getting into that next week. Uh, this Shabbat uh, class, Ross, what is it? That's right. We are continuing in the book of uh, Exodus. We just mm -hmm. finished. We just left Horev. 
So we're going to continue that process, and I look forward to continuing the Pentateuch, uh, a new look, and that's going to be um, Torah portion, Truma. Truma. So that's Truma. Exodus 25 right. through 27. Can't wait. Hmm. Join me Saturday. There you go. And look. Join, this group, and speaking of joining, yep. Yep, the Yachad. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the group that's with us tonight, uh, mm. we're going to go into a different room, and we're going to talk to them for a while. And I might even drop the name of the person who chiseled that off of the wall so the uh, Yachad okay. members know. Yachad is, is very simply to help support everything that we do. Uh, and, and so a person can join the YouTube channel, become a member on the YouTube channel, become a member of our Patreon, or even join the Horeb Discord server and uh, mm. support us financially there. So anyway, any amount works, you're in the Yakad. And Jono, let's go share some stuff with this group. I'm, I want to. We are going the there right now. We're doing that right now. Uh, and lastly, of course, the, um, uh, the 81st UI Annual Conference uh, is coming up in April. And uh, Roscom can put the details there in the comments section. And uh, all we ask is it's, it's free to, to come, but just let us know that That's you right. are coming uh, so that we can you have to, register. to you and make, have to register, uh, make sure that we make room for that. So we're heading over to the Yachad. Now we'll be back this time next week uh, where we are getting into that trip to Leipzig and what happens there. And until then, have a great week, dear listeners, have dear viewers. Have a beautiful, beautiful week.